Namaste and welcome to this exciting episode of Sathology Debunking Mythology. What happened in France? And you all know what Sathology stands for. We are neither left nor right. We are dharmic. And we follow, we take good from both sides and report on bad on both sides. So today we have an exciting election outcome. Not good for many French people. But for some, they are celebrating today. But we will go into the depth from a French Indian. I'll say him Indian proudly because he's as much connected to our culture as he's connected to the French culture. So without delay, let us welcome our French Bhartiya journalist, Kum Kapatiya. Namaste. <laughs> namaste, namaste. So... What's happening with France? Like what, what happened in France? And like I can show you what happened right now. I'll make a screen and people can see. It's written in French. And uh, this is the EU outcome of Marie Le Pen. And she won every single election over there. Every single. And she was celebrating, I think, prematurely. But when the federal elections happened, then she lost. What happened between this and the second phase? It all has to do with the electoral system in France, which is a uh, two-stage uh, election. And uh, I like to say that it's a highly monitored and uh, guided democracy. There is always a fear in the French, or at least uh, the system, uh, is always uh, trying to prevent any untoward happening as far as election results are concerned, which means that they don't want to upset the uh, Apple card or not the boat, and they want to make sure that whoever wins uh, is somehow in tune with the current establishment and the current uh, status quo. So, as a result, the first round, of course, gave uh, the national rally, which has been rising steadily for the last 30 years, with some ups and downs, but generally rising. It's a 52 year old party. So, as was widely predicted, they did achieve a very uh, good. Uh, score very good results in the first round, but uh, because it was uh, only the first round, uh, in very few constituencies, one party won over 50 percent, which means they didn't have to go for the second round. But in the all the others, probably 85 percent of the candidates were uh, balanced, nobody got 50 percent, so they were two or three who shared most of the votes. And under the French system, the three uh, top uh, rating candidates or uh, three candidates who get the most votes have to run again in the second round. And uh, what happens very often in such cases is that the parties that do not want the candidate of another party to be elected will gang up, which means that they will decide through the high command uh, decision that one of the two candidates who is regarded as uh, likely to be defeated will leave his place will essentially withdraw in favor of another candidate who is regarded as more likely to succeed. So that happens between both the right and left parties against what they call the far right, which I think now has lost its meaning because uh, anybody you don't like becomes far right and uh, the far left is not considered far left anymore, but uh, somehow the center is lending to the left and so is the center right. So the whole thing has become highly confused and Marine Le Pen uh, said that uh, it's no longer between right and left, it's between nationalists or patriots uh, and globalists. So uh, we may uh, argue about that definition, but I think it's broadly true. Between those who really think the world should be ruled by one system and uh, it should all be integrated within the great neoliberal uh, polity, and those who uh, think that each nation should uh, chart its own course, decide its future, and need not align with the global banking and financial institutions, which also tend to dictate ideologies. So that's pretty much where we are. The second round allowed the national rally to win 50% more seats, so they did very well. I mean, it's 50% growth. <coughs> but <coughs> they were not able to win absolute majority, which was uh, not regarded as likely because of the system that I have just evoked. And, uh, you know, uh, democracies are uh, a highly subjective uh, thing, you know. I mean, Indonesia is a democracy, uh, Iran is a democracy, 
So you can argue about the system uh, because in the end, uh, if the system is not really allowing everybody to uh, compete equally, then uh, you can, of course, argue about the merits of the democracy. To give you one example, uh, the British had their elections just uh, a few days before the French. And because the um, opposition, uh, the Labour Party, uh, got about 30% of the votes, they got 400 seats. Uh, whereas with about the same percentage, 30%, the national rally is only at about 25% uh, of the final tally. So you can see the difference. If uh, the national rally had been in England, they would have swept the polls. On the other hand, uh, you can see the difference in England between the Reform Party of uh, Farage. Uh, he got 4 million votes, but he only has uh, four seats in Parliament, whereas the Lib Dems, Liberal Democrats, who got only 3.6 million votes, have 30, 72 seats. So tell me where the logic is. Well, that's a system, you know, the mysteries of the system. So that gives you a broad background. The left didn't win. In fact, nobody won. Uh, in fact, the left remained pretty much stationary. But what they did is gang up between six parties that basically hate each other and have nothing in common or very little in common. And they decided to gang get together in order to try to block the national rally. And as a result, they got more votes together. In other words, they got 180 seats instead of the 150 of the national rally. I'm rounding up here. And then uh, basically now they are considering the possibility of aligning with Macron's own uh, bloc, which is also made up of different parties that have different leaders, but who, who basically tend to support Macron. And therefore, they might be able to cobble together some very unwieldy coalition to form a government that will obviously be fragile and probably rather inefficient because uh, the government will not have any common agenda. So that gives you pretty much the scenario as it is now. So tell me one thing, like, uh, do you think there was a foreign involvement in making the left win in France? There is a foreign involvement in almost all elections. And you know that very well in India, as well as you know it in the US. The only, uh, you know, reservation that is made about that is that some people like to talk about uh, interference by foreign powers that are regarded as uh, unfriendly, but they do not talk about the involvement of foreign powers which are regarded as friendly, or at least which they regard as friendly. So, the, I mean, let's face it, the major media are closely controlled or at least closely monitored by the intelligence agencies, which primarily means, of course, the CIA, um, some others, such as the Mossad, such as uh, some uh, Chinese and uh, Islamic agencies, and uh, also uh, by uh, the Russian agencies. Although I would say to a lesser extent, but anyway, that's a matter of uh, weightage. Uh, the fact is that uh, no election takes place without manipulations from behind uh, for to get certain results and to avoid other results. So the, the manipulation was clear because right away the international agencies and the European agencies got involved warning France that uh, any swing to the far right or to the far left would be catastrophic for French finances and uh, for Europe and possibly for the global finance because uh, it would upset the... Uh, essentially the rating, the security rating that France has in terms of uh, its debt. Remember, France has 3 trillion uh, euros or dollars in debt, and a lot of it is owned by American funds, uh, such as uh, BlackRock. And BlackRock was very closely monitoring French elections, and uh, just before the elections took place, the chairman of BlackRock, uh, Fink, came to see Macron, just as he had come to see Keith Starmer in England, Keir Starmer in England. And he told Macron, uh, you better be careful because if you don't have a plan B and if somehow you, you know, your party is no longer in control, then uh, the French uh, debt rating will be lowered as a result of which uh, you might not be able to pay the interest on your debt. And then there will be catastrophe because uh, France could become insolvent. And we will have to put very strict uh, you know, restrictions on the French budget. Uh, in other words, you would have to slash your public expenditures, you would have to slash pensions, 
uh, in other words, everything that happened to Greece. So France is, based, is under the, the gun, you know that way. And uh, that's why they have to somehow make sure that they keep some semblance of stability economically and politically. That's not a given, but it is certainly the priority. So, so what is the? Uh, so I'm I'm reading a lot of data coming on the forex, the EU dollar forex trade, and also the Bitcoin, the role of Bitcoin, funding the left and the center. Do you think it was it is unholy or unethical for after the elections, left and center combine and to form a government defeating the right, even though? Mary Le Pen won the most percentage of votes, 36 percent, and everyone else was like Macron's party won 28 percent, and the other uh, centrists won 22 percent. So this is the election percentage. So do you think the collusion was done through or financing was done through the forex and Bitcoin? It's very possible. You see, there are so many manipulations taking place that uh, it's very hard to track. Uh, the transfer of funds that take place. Uh, and uh, again, when you're asking me, is it fair for the center and the left to align against the right? Well, of course, in their opinion, this is fair because they are preventing a major threat, averting a major threat to uh, the system, the status quo. And uh, they call the National Rally and some other uh, so-called far-right parties as non-Republican. They acknowledge they are democratic because they follow the election rules and procedures, but they say they are not uh, Republican, whatever that means. So uh, in America, of course, that would be rather funny. But uh, in Europe, Republican, at least in France, Republican means that you basically accept the system entirely. And that is not true of uh, some of the left-wing parties, far-left parties, for example, the France Insoumise, which is in, in English translates as the uh, rebellious or unsubmissive France. Uh, which is uh, the biggest left-wing party. It's uh, considered le far left by many. And it uh, says it wants to abolish this republic and create a sixth republic, which would be a socialistic, uh, universalistic republic that would be very pro-third world, very pro-Islamic, very pro-African, uh, and which would strive to increase immigration in France so that France becomes a truly... Uh, what they call a mixed blood country, or a country which is as African or Asian as it is European. So that is an agenda which is regarded as far left, and they are, of course, in a way feared, but then they have never been able to rise above 70 uh, representatives or deputies among the 550, that, uh, I'm not going to remember the number, but it's more than 500 deputies. So they are not regarded as likely to ever take power, and uh, they have never been able to get uh, their candidate uh, for the presidency to, uh, to get more than, I think, 15 or 20 percent of the votes. It's a lot, but it's not enough to scare people uh, to an extent. You know. So uh, it, what I'm trying to say is that the fact that the far left and the center allied is simply a, another instance of the fact that there is this, a, a, a particular status quo which uh, tries to survive by balancing out the right and the left and uh, retaining power in the middle. So I was, uh, I was looking at the data and you can see the flags coming on board here. You can see the, my screen. I don't see a single French flag in the entire crowd. It's a communist and Palestinian flags all over the crowd. So do you think that the immigration policy of France, which has still maintains a lot of colonies in the France and also in Asia Pacific, you're like uh, Reunion Islands, New Caledonia, these are all French territories. French Guyana in South America is a completely French government colony, even today. Uh, there are 19 French colonies. And do you think it's a revolt by those people are opposing their policies like the what the France is doing in New Caledonia is almost like uh, destroying the native culture over there and uh, so do you think it's a revolt for that that they're bringing it into France now I think the overseas territories as they are called are uh, very small in terms of population and they do not have much of an influence uh, but their, they people are, their people their people are traveling to France on French passports Yes, but then there are still very few. Uh, 
so the, the influence is not so great. The major influence is exercised by the immigrants, old and new, from uh, primarily from Africa and to an extent from the Middle East. So they are the ones who are uh, the most uh, organized uh, in the largest numbers and who many of them have French passports or are, uh, have refugee status and are waiting for uh, nationalization at some point. Uh, but they are the ones who really have a major influence because they are coordinated and supported by Islamic uh, uh, forces uh, from abroad, such as Algeria, such as the Emirates, particularly Qatar, uh, such as uh, possibly Iran, and uh, so Morocco, so those and Turkey. So these are the populations that are very deeply committed uh, to certain causes, such as uh, the growth of the Islamic polity in France, including perhaps adoption of Sharia law in some parts. And then they are also committed to the Palestinian cause and to the struggle against uh, Israeli colonialism. So uh, that gives them a very strong common platform. And they have very strong allies in the left, because a lot of the French left, not the Socialist Party, but the other socialists, I mean, communist socialist forces, are very pro-Palestinian and, generally speaking, pro-Muslim. Uh, uh, not necessarily pro-religion in the sense of pro-Islam, but that is what it amounts to because they support the so-called oppressed people and therefore uh, the Muslim causes uh, pretty much worldwide. Like I was showing while you were speaking, I was showing all the French territories all over the world. And uh, these are the, all the territories which France currently administers. And now these are all into the play because it's, and I've not shown the 14 countries in using CFR in Africa who are also opposing. And many of these people have French national, national, national passports. And, uh, and, and I see when these people, they are collectively coming and they, this hold significantly anti-French sentiment, significantly. New Caledonia well, is burning. I wouldn't, I wouldn't generalize because in some of those uh, over, overseas uh, territories, such as the Caribbean, the French Caribbean, there is also a very strong uh, support for the national rally. So you can see that they are quite divided because some of those people, in fact, uh, consider themselves French. Uh, they are very proud of it. Uh, not in New Caledonia. Uh, New Caledonia, of course, is divided between the French immigrants and the natives, right? But uh, if you look at uh, islands and territories that have a very old French presence, um, including, of course, uh, La Guadeloupe, Martinique, Réunion, uh, there is, in some of the, amongst many of them, in fact, uh, substantial portions of the population, a very strong pro-national uh, rally sentiment. One, because the national rally has been very active there, promoting their agenda, and they have even quite a few members and candidates uh, of the national rally who come from these areas. Uh, and they do oppose a lot of the policies of uh, the current system in France, of the current government, which they consider very colonialistic. And, you know, it goes deeply because, for example, a lot of those people are very Christian. And uh, they do not approve of the French government, which is outspokenly uh, secular. And, for example, I remember in uh, La Martinique, one of the key reasons, so they said, that they were against Macron, is that they said Macron doesn't live by any Christian values, he lives with a man. Uh, that is, of course, because of the urban legend that Mrs. Macron is a man. <laughs> and whatever that may be, the fact is that it has influenced those people in a deep way because they are conservative and they hold on to all Christian French values. Like French Guiana. French Guiana supports heavily left, is anti-French, yes. large extent. Yes, French Guiana has a very strong uh, communist tradition, right? Yeah, it's the largest uh, French territory outside of France, French Guiana. And they are very much uh, anti-colonial attitude of France. I mean, I mean, they support Macron to a large extent, who has promised them freedom at one point of time. I don't know whether that's going to happen or not. So I don't think it will happen because Guyana is a French department in the sense that it is not considered a colony. It is actually a full-fledged French administrative territory, uh, which is run according to electoral democracy, just yes. like uh, Normandy or, uh, you know, or Provence. 
So it's yeah. very unlikely that uh, Macron would be able to give them independence. And remember, Macron is on his last leg. He's probably not going to last very long. So there is it's very unlikely he'll make any decisions of that, you know, importance anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I agree with you because it's a, these territories which I'm showing on the screen, they're fully administered departments of France. They are not colonies. They are not separate administrations. So elections, when they're held in the main uh, French territory in Europe, the elections are held here too, both. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's considered part of the U Union of France. That's what they say. But I'm just saying the locals are... are French Guyana has a significant opposition to the French rule. Significant. I was there and I can tell you firsthand, like they don't want to put French flag anywhere. But they are putting in the government buildings only. That's where they, they put it mostly. And also the French soccer team. Everybody is very famous. Mm -hmm. That's 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 the biggest binding factor they have. Yeah. And, and the Guadalupe, I was there two weeks ago. No, four weeks ago. And uh, beautiful island close to USA. And uh, and it has the same thing. And I was talking to a lot of significant native population also there. It's it has a French naval base also, and they are also very much pro pro independence. So there are at least I can say out of eleven territories I have, which are fully French owned, eight of them are asking for independence from France on many reasons, and they have a significant population which is in France. So do you think that this is the uh, this is the reason why why people are opposing so much? The left is so strong. No, I don't think so, because uh, as I told you, uh, they may uh, side with one party or another. But remember, uh, like Guadeloupe, for example, like all the Caribbean islands, has no native population. The only two major populations are the people of French uh, extraction and Africans, who came, of course, as slaves to work on the sugar and uh, other plantations. So uh, between the blacks and the whites, there is, although there are a lot of mixed blood people, uh, there is a tension and an opposition. Naturally, the people who are originally French are uh, pro-France. They do not want independence. Those people who are African, uh, they tend to be, of course, much more uh, unsatisfied about the conditions. And they would like independence. But then again, you see, I would also doubt that this will really happen in the foreseeable future because uh, they also are getting a lot of subsidies from France. And without that, they probably would get considerably poorer. The situation is not so good now, but it could get worse. And remember, it's like Puerto Rico wants independence from the US, but you know, it's not really happening. And uh, these things are uh, more like uh, sentimental, you know, Scotland wanting to separate from England, but in the end, it doesn't uh, really uh, work out when it comes to, when push comes to call. So I don't think between you and me, that's not a big problem. The major problem is of massive immigration from North Africa and Africa which is changing the very, uh, I would say, the very nature of the French population. It's like a population replacement. Because in the end, now, if you go to big cities in France and even to smaller cities, uh, you will find that uh, probably, I mean, a very high percentage of people is just not uh, French and not European. They come from any part of Africa, from the Middle East, from Central, you know, from South Asia now more and more, from the far, uh, Southeast Asia. Vietnam and all the other countries that have the French uh, uh, rule, and of course from South America and Central America as well. So, do, do you think uh, you know? Uh, since we are connected on both sides, US and India, so I will ask you one personal question: Do you think that the the French policies in their foreign territories and also? colonial territories like African, 14 countries of Africa are resulting in this situation in France. People are taking revenge. That's what I want to say. People from Africa are taking revenge on the French state and anti-French policies because these children, I will call them children because they are young kids. They are, many of them are very young, 20, 21 and backed by the foreign money. They are burning France. Like I can't recognize Paris today. Today, Trump gave a statement also, and uh, Biden is obviously quiet. Trump gave a statement that we don't want to turn U.S. into France. So it's a very bad comparison. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. No, uh, you know, I, basically, I would agree with you. In fact, everyone who can see things as they are would agree with you. Uh, 
Uh, vengeance is a factor, uh, particularly because a lot of those uh, people uh, were radicalized and are being radicalized by various uh, propaganda outfits, including uh, the French left, which is uh, not helping in that sense because they are uh, saying that uh, you know any, any struggle against colonization is justified, however violent, and therefore uh, you have no reason to have allegiance to France. Uh, they may not say that in so many words, but that's what they imply. Because even though you live here and you have a French passport, you, you are primarily from somewhere else and you are probably a Muslim. So you have to establish clear distinctions between, for example, black Africans, many of whom are Christian, and who uh, do not want any trouble. Most of them are just uh, trying to make a living and some of them are doing well and others are not doing so well. But they, are no, they have no political uh, grudges because they don't like their own governments in many cases. They don't think they would like to live in their own countries in Africa. And they feel that by and large they are doing better in France than they might do in one of the black African countries. On the other hand, the Muslims have a very distinct position generally uh, because uh, Islam uh, tries, wherever it is established in sufficient numbers, tries to establish a Muslim polity. Uh, which is considered in a way the duty of a Muslim to live in an area in which Islam is the rule. Therefore, they would certainly like to see uh, a more Islamic France and to, in certain areas at least, to have their own laws, their own traditions and their own customs. And they already do have that. Uh, the question is whether uh, this uh, impulse for a separate identity uh, will lead them uh, to uh, try to break away openly from the French state, which is what is being talked about a lot because even Macron and his government have often tried to take uh, steps against what they call secessionism, uh, which of course means separatism, which means that some areas of uh, France which have a Muslim majority or a very, very substantial Muslim minority would like to have separate uh, government. Uh, under their own uh, cultural uh, dispensation. You see, so that is, of course, a danger all over Europe, clearly. And that's why many countries, uh, such as Hungary, Poland, and uh, the Czech Republic, have uh, rejected any kind of uh, large uh, Muslim immigration because they are afraid it will eventually lead to uh, splitting up uh, their nations. So that's what you are witnessing in France in a more acute way because uh, immigration is very large and uh, it is supported, I mean, the, the sort of radicalization of immigrants is supported by governments such as the Algerian government. For example, the Algerian government is intervening very uh, openly in French elections, saying that they, they would not accept a national rally government because it's regarded as anti-immigrant and France should remain secular and left-wing oriented. Uh, even though uh, Algeria is not at all left-wing, it is in fact ruled by a military-backed uh, single party. And uh, it, back to France, uh, back by France, back by France, they're back by France again, France again, Algeria. Yes, no, no, Algeria is by far the country that has the most problematic relation with France because of the legacy of the civil war and the uh, war of liberation. Morocco doesn't have the same problem because the Moroccan government remains generally in good terms with France and they uh, have an interest in keeping uh, good relations. Uh, the same can be said pretty much about Tunisia. So it's mostly Algeria, uh, which has traditionally has a, had a very radical uh, anti-French government, even though a lot of Algerians live in France and many of the rich Algerians actually also live in France uh, because they find it uh, somehow uh, you know, more attractive <laughs> to live there. So there is a great deal of uh, ambiguity there. You know, on the one hand, they have their official policy, and then privately, they like to keep good relations and keep their money and their estates in France. I would assume that from the point of view of Republicans and uh, American ultra-right-wing MAGA crowd, is that France has, France has fallen. That, that's a narrative in the US which is building up. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a fairly common view. I mean, you find that among some European countries as well, you know, that uh, such as, again, Hungary or Poland, they are very concerned about the turn France has taken. And let's say uh, Germany is in about the same situation. Uh, so the major French and European countries are now facing a massive problem of uh, 
I mean, it's an internal problem primarily, but it's a problem having to do with the change in the very uh, nature of the population and therefore a change in the ideology in general, you know, because uh, you are having now very sharp division between the nationalist, more traditionalist French, and those people who are, for one reason or another, ethnic or political, who basically want to break up France, perhaps within a larger European Union, but they don't agree with the European Union either because they know that it is a very liberal, neoliberal, uh, globalist, capitalist entity, whereas they want some sort of socialist policy. So, you see, uh, the, the division is there, but the confusion is also there. Do you think the Palestine issue, which is Palestine is far away from France, and French have very little involvement in the Palestine issue, but still the Palestine flags are being flown in France, do you think the deep state is using Palestine issue to radicalize Muslims and activate mosques for rights? I'm sure lots of games are being played. You see, much of the French media and the French establishment is... Uh, more or less controlled by very pro-Zionist elements. We are talking about the global banking families. So they do have a big role in supporting and promoting Israel, uh, which is very, very strong in France. There's no question that we are talking, when you're talking about the French establishment, uh, no matter what people might think privately, the official policy is one of strong identification and support with Israel. On the other hand, you have a growing, uh, I would say, developing country population uh, supported by the French left, which of course has a strong presence in the popular uh, underprivileged areas. And they, are, they have a strong sympathy for Palestine and they regard Israel as an oppressive uh, state which uh, is supported by global capitalism. So you have there a very sharp division between uh, the traditionally, you might say, anti-Semitic left and the pro-Semitic center right, or, I mean, Semitic means nothing because Palestinians are Semites too, so I'm talking about pro-Zionist and anti-Zionist rather than pro and anti-Semites. And uh, then what's interesting is that the French Communist Party used to have a lot of uh, Jews in it, uh, particularly in its leadership. And now this has changed because the French Communist Party is a shadow of its former self. It's much reduced. And a lot of those uh, members of the Communist Party, including Jews, have migrated to the national rally. Uh, you might say that they do that partly because they are afraid of the Muslim presence, and therefore they think the national rally uh, provides a uh, direction, an orientation that can reduce and eliminate, in a way, the Muslim threat. And then it comes from the fact that the National Rally has embraced a lot of the uh, populist or socialist programs of the Communist Party to help the poor. So, as a result, the uh, National Rally now is the home of many former communists. And on the other hand, a lot of the radical left has become very pro-Palestinian and uh, pro-Muslim. Uh, and as a result, uh, a lot of uh, Jews, particularly rich, influential Jews, have become quite uneasy and uncomfortable with the French left. So you see, it's a very complex picture because there are lots of evolutions and changes that have taken place. Uh, do, you think, do you think that Macron will be the new president or is somebody else who is going to come? Well, Macron is not, uh, is not in question at this point. Well, he's in question, but constitutionally, he has three more years and uh, there is no election until then. So, and the term of the president is fixed. So, unless you are able to somehow uh, impeach him, and the process of impeachment in France is not defined as in the American Constitution, so uh, there is no real challenge to his official position. What is likely to happen is that Macron uh, will become a very powerless president. He's already a lame duck, but he has been a lame duck for the last two years since his uh, re election. And therefore, there is not too much he can do. He can talk a lot, but uh, it's not clear that he can implement his uh, decisions. Because he will have to appoint a prime minister who probably will not be from his side. And uh, remember, Macron has no real party. He just has a group of people who uh, got together around him. He recruited them on the internet. <laughs> That's a, 
<laughs> it's a funny story, but it is true. He basically asked them to apply on the internet and he chose the people to be his ministers and all that by having them stand for elections. So he doesn't really have any uh, traditional or constitutional party with him. He has got a group of people who decided that they would trust him as their leader. Now, a lot of those people are now turned away and they are not listening to him. So as a result, he has become very isolated. And though he's president, there is no uh, indication that he will be able to exercise much executive power. So that is the situation right now. But of course, unless he decides to resign, is likely to be there for another three years. And then there will be presidential elections, and uh, that's where probably Marine Le Pen will try her luck again. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you, Kohn Kapatie, and thank you for all the viewers for watching. I think this is the most insightful French analysis you ever heard. And I think for viewers, do like it, share it, and let me know your feedback, do ask questions. The show is in English, and then you can tell me what, how do you like the interview. Thank you, Kom Kapatia, and we'll see you again. In Thank you very much. See you soon. All the best to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.